Good morning. My name is Tom Hall, and I'm the senior pastor at First Presbyterian Church in Pittsburgh. Welcome to our live stream worship this morning, which will start in just a few minutes with our prelude music. Thank you for joining us. Good morning and welcome to worship at First Presbyterian Church of Pittsburgh. We are glad that you have chosen to join us this Lord's Day. We are thankful for the technology that allows all of you to join us in worship from afar. But we long for the time when we can again worship together in this space. When that time comes, and it will come, Know that it is our intent to maintain the streaming and online worship presence for those who are unable to join us in person. Two brief announcements. To complement the, the year-long sermon series on the book of John, uh, the pastors are leading Bible studies on the book on Sunday evenings at 6 o'clock p.m. Pastor Tom is leading, uh, excuse me, wow, 
Pastor Dan is leading his Bible study on Sunday evenings at 6 p.m. And Pastor Tom is leading his Bible study on Wednesday evenings at 7 p.m. If you would wish to attend either Bible study, please email either pastor to let them know to expect you, and you will receive an email with a Zoom link to the study. There are also two Zoom groups that meet weekly for prayer for the church and all who are struggling. If you are able, I encourage you to join one of these groups. On Sunday mornings at 9 a.m., Pastor Dan Turris leads a prayer group for one hour. And on Thursday mornings at 7.30 a.m., Judy Shipley leads a group for one hour of prayer and spiritual care. Contact information for these two groups is available in the weekly email blast. If you are not receiving the email blast and would like to do so, please contact Cheryl Swartz in the church office. Because the word became flesh and dwelt among us, we have seen the glory of the Son, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. Let us turn our hearts and minds toward God and worship him, the source of grace and truth. Please join me in this morning's call to worship. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of God's glory. Together, let us worship our God. is built, 
We approach the throne of God's grace, confessing our sins by laying down our burden before the Lord and accepting his forgiveness. We are free to receive his word for us today. Please join me first in the confession of our corporate sin and then silently as we confess our private sins. Holy and merciful God, in your presence, we confess our failure to be what you created us to be. You alone know how often we have sinned in wandering from your ways, in wasting your gifts, in forgetting your love. By your loving mercy, help us to live in your light and abide in your ways for the sake of Jesus Christ our Savior. Lord, now hear our silent prayers of confession. Amen. Anyone who is in Christ is a new creation. The old life is gone a new life has begun. Thanks, know that you are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Good morning, children. So good to come into your home. I hope you've had a good week. Today's Bible story comes from the Spark Story Bible. Peter, James, and John were very excited. They were climbing a mountain with Jesus. Higher and higher they climbed right to the very top. Then they noticed something different about Jesus. Jesus' face and his clothes were bright and shiny like the sun. Moses and the, the prophet Elijah were standing with Jesus, talking about God's promise to save the world. Peter couldn't believe his eyes that he was seeing this. When suddenly a cloud covered the mountain and then a voice said, this is my son, listen to him. The voice was God's. Peter, James and John covered their faces. Then Jesus touched them and they looked up but everything was the way it, it had been right before. Even Jesus looked like he always did. Well, on their way back down the mountain, Jesus, Peter, and James talked about God's promise. But they didn't tell anyone else what happened on the mountain for a long time. Let's pray. Oh God, we thank you for Jesus. We praise you for sending Jesus. Help us to love you every day more and more. And help us see you at work in the world. And know that it is you. Amen.
Hello, friends, would you pray with me? Oh, Lord God Almighty, by the power of your Holy Spirit, open our minds and our hearts to understand that the Word has become flesh, that the one who spoke everything into being has become one of us and is speaking with us today. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, we're still in the beginning stages of our year-long study of the Gospel of John. And today we're looking again for the third time at the prologue to John, John 1, verses 1 through 18. But today we're focusing mostly on one verse, John 1, 14. If you pick up a new book, sometimes you are tempted to skip over the prologue, are you not? You're, skimped, you're tempted to skip over the prologue and go right to the, the, to the content but you don't want to do that with John. John 1, verses 14 through 18. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son, who came from the Father full of grace and truth. John testified concerning him. He cried out, saying, This is the one I spoke about when I said, he who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. Out of his fullness we have all received grace in place of grace already given. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God but the one and only Son who is himself God and is in closest relationship with the Father has made him known. This is God's word. During my Air Force career, I had the opportunity to meet several of the men who had been held as prisoners of war in Hanoi during the Vietnam War. Many of them had been held in solitary confinement for years and years, and they had been tortured in unimaginable ways. Yet many of them also told these incredible stories of, of heroism and, and of the things they were able to accomplish in prison, even in solitary confinement. Now the North Vietnam, the North Vietnamese had strict rules against POWs communicating with each other. You could not even make a sound that was heard outside of your cell, or you'd be tortured. And so the POWs developed a kind of tap, a tap code, a simple way of communicating like an abbreviated Morse code that enabled to tap out letters on the wall to be heard by the person in the cell next to yours. More than one of the POWs said that the person in the cell next to them taught, um, taught them another language 
or taught them a master's level course simply by tapping out letters to form words on the wall. One of the man, men who told that story that I met was Ed Hubbard. He'd been flying in the back seat of a fighter when he was shot down over North Vietnam. He was held in Vietnam for six and a half years. He later wrote a book called Escape from the, the Box, Escape from the Box, The Wonder of Human Potential. And he talked about the importance of having something beyond your circumstances to live for. He said that in time, he was able to feel like the one who was free, and he even felt sorry for his North Vietnamese captors. He told the story of how the doorframe, he told the story how the doorframe to his cell had rotted away. And so his guards wanted him to fix it. And what they did is they brought in these huge beams and a sledgehammer and some big bolts, some flat end bolts. The guards wanted him to fix it with that. And he said, well, you haven't given me the right tools. I, I don't even have a drill. And the guard just shook, it head, shook his head. You have so little imagination, you Americans, he said. And he got the sledgehammer, the guard got the sledgehammer, and drove the bolt right through that big beam. And so Ed Hubbard began to learn that human beings are capable of so much more than they can imagine, and that there is meaning and purpose in life even when everything you count on for meaning has been taken away. So I suggest that this is part of the startling truth that John has for us today. Meaning and purpose, in fact, ultimate meaning and ultimate purpose have come into the world, into your life through the word made flesh, Jesus Christ. One of the great theologians in our Reformed tradition was the late R.C. Sproul. And he said that this part of the New Testament, this prologue to John, captured the imagination of the early church more than any other part of the New Testament. He said the prologue kept the theologians busy for 300 years. They were in awe, you see, of who John said that Jesus Christ was. And there was nothing about the prologue that fascinated them more than John 1 verse 14. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. The word is Jesus Christ. And as we said before, the word, the Greek word for word here is logos, where we get our word logic. Jesus is the logic that became flesh. The logic that became flesh? Yeah, in a sense, yes. You know, as we said, logos was an important word to the Greeks. The Logos was the logic, the organizing principle for how the world worked. Greek philosophers, mostly the Stoics, equated the Logos with reason and said reason was divine. Not just reasonableness, but the reason the world worked. And so John comes along and he took that Greek word loved by the philosophers and applied it to Jesus Christ. And so the Logos was no longer just an abstract organizing principle. The Logos was a person. Jesus Christ was not just the member of the Trinity who spoke the universe into being. He wasn't just the logic of the universe. He wasn't just the reason for it. And not just the reason for it, but the reason the universe holds together. The reason it works and keeps on working. Breathtaking. Breathtaking. And so all this and so much more is why the early church was so captivated by John's view of who Jesus Christ was. But they were also in awe of what it said about human beings. If the one true creator God did all that, what does it say about us? If Jesus Christ is the reason for the universe, that means he's got to be the reason for you, for us as, as well. Your logic, your organizing principle, the reason for your being is Jesus Christ too. What makes 
you, you, is Jesus Christ. And so John said that Jesus was the word become flesh. Now the scholars were fascinated with that too. For some scholars said that Jesus really, Jesus really wasn't being, really wasn't a human being. He just seemed to be one. Or some said that Jesus was a human being, but he was inhabited by God. And others said, well, the word became flesh, well, that's just a metaphor for how God identifies with us. John says, no, none of the above. The entire Christian faith revolves around the incarnation that Jesus Christ is the word became flesh, that Jesus Christ is both God and man. And so the infinite became finite the immortal became mortal. The all-powerful became powerless. Jesus was real flesh and blood. You could touch him. You could hold him. You could smell him. You could feel his breath on your cheek when he kissed you. On the cross, it wasn't just the human being Jesus who died. God didn't somehow slip out of Jesus at the last moment and let the human Jesus die alone. We don't believe that. No, on the cross, God died. Both God and, and man died on the cross. So Jesus had to be human to identify with us, and Jesus had to be God to take the punishment for us all. I was reading Tim Keller, I read a lot of Tim Keller, I was reading a sermon this week, and the way he put this struck me like it had never struck me before. He said that Jesus not only had to be man, but he also had to be God, and because he was God, Keller said, his death and blood have infinite value. They can pay for anything. They can pay for anything. They can pay for all of us. And Keller says that's why in Acts 20, the church, it says that the church is something that God purchased with his own blood. The church is something God purchased with his own blood. So what is the blood of God worth? You could buy anything. It's, it's of infinite value. And do you see what this says about you? What it says about what you're worth, that God spent something of infinite value on you. Hmm. It's breathtaking. But of course, there's a problem. Over and over, people fail to recognize who Jesus was. It's one of the main themes of John's gospel, and it's one of life's great paradoxes, is it not? And the reason, of course, is so simple, yet it's so hard for people to grasp. We don't expect the word to become flesh. We don't expect the reason for our lives to come to us. By reason, of course, I'm talking about meaning or identity. We have been taught. No, I, I, I actually think it's more than that. We, we've been taught, and our fallen hearts are also anxious to believe that meaning and identity are things we construct. We make our own meaning, we think. It's up to us. We construct our own reason for living. And if we believe that, and we do, then of course when God comes to us, there's no way we're going to accept him. There's no way we're going to see him as our reason for being. We all do this, and we think it's the most normal thing in the world. They did it in Jesus' day, but in a slightly different way. The Greeks of Jesus' day had different schools of philosophy who basically said that meaning was found through the way you lived. The Stoics, for example, said the point of Jesus' life was the point of life was to seek virtue, to live in harmony with nature, to control your emotions. But the Epicureans had a different way. They said the point was to seek enjoyment, contentment. Happiness was achieved when you avoided pain or anxiety. 
But the Jews believed that the point of life was to live according to the will and purpose of the one true God. Okay, that's a little better. But the God that John describes here, the word who became flesh, was still offensive to everyone's worldview. Jesus was the divine reason which defended the Greeks. Jesus was God in the flesh, which offended the Jews. But no one could imagine that their worldview was now taken up into the person of Jesus Christ. Now, we talk here all the time. It's, I think it's one of, been one of the main themes of my preaching through the years that any identity you construct is ultimately going to let you down. If you construct it, it's going to let you down. The example this week, it's all over the news, is politics. Politics. You know, this week, President Biden, in his inaugural address, called for unity, and he was roundly applauded on all sides for that. But you know, did you notice that the good feelings didn't last one news cycle? Why is that really? Because enough of us have made politics the place where we get our meaning. Politics has become the place we are our meaning. We have made politics, at least many of us, have made politics an ultimate thing. One side is fighting for God and country. The other side is fighting for justice. And each side feels like the only way to get ahead is to defeat the other side and take power. But each side feels like the other side is winning. So many of us have made politics an ultimate thing. Listen to the language. The election is the most consequential in history. The fate of democracy hangs in the balance. The ultimate language. Each side, each side gets its meaning and its purpose from its own worldview. And so what each side is saying, it's not just the election that's at stake. It's the logic of my life that's at stake. It's the meaning of life It's at stake. Our reason for living hangs in the balance. So of course the other side has to be defeated at all costs. Do you see? If you get your identity, your meaning in life from something in this world, from something you create or something someone else created, you're going to be crushed. And when it happens, you're going to lash out. And look, elections are important. Public policy is important. But as you get caught up in the causes of the day, and there are important, those things cannot be ultimate in your life. They cannot be your reason for living. They cannot be the logic of your life. You see, the real source of meaning is infinitely greater. There was an editorial in the Post-Gazette two weeks ago by Keith Burris, and it captured the Christian worldview. Burris said that the people who stormed the Capitol are your neighbors. He said the kids, the people who walked in protests last summer are your kids. The people who marched and the people who protest are your neighbors and your kids. Every single person is someone Jesus Christ identified with in his incarnation. The God-man Jesus Christ came to you and to your neighbor and to your child and he lived the life. He created you all to live. He came to you, your neighbor and your child, and he died the death you all deserved. He came to you and your neighbor and your child, and he defeated death, and he paid the price for all your sins. And so you all are of infinite value. Your relationship to God has been restored through his blood, all of you. But as long as most people consider politics an ultimate thing in place of the one true ultimate thing, Jesus Christ, unity is going to be elusive. But John says there's more. 
the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. The Greek word for made his dwelling can be mean moved into the neighborhood. It also means pitched his tent among us. In the Old Testament, of course, it's thinking this is the image of God telling the Israelites to build a great tent called a tabernacle to be a place, a movable place where God would live. And later he told them to be a temple, a permanent place where God would come to live and take up residence. But whether God was in the temple or in the tent, it didn't make any difference. God was unapproachable. But now John says that God has become approachable. He's pitched a tent in our backyard. God is camping out back. The ultimate has become approachable. But even more, even more, John says, we have seen his glory. Now, how could that be? Remember, the ancient Jews believed that God was absolutely holy. You could not even look at God and live. The great prophet Elijah was only allowed to get a glimpse of the hem of God's robe. Of course, we hear the word glory and we think of great accomplishments in sports. So how can John say, we have seen his glory? And the answer, of course, is because the glory of Jesus Christ is in his humility. The glory of Jesus Christ is not in his achievements. It isn't in defeating his opponents. It's not even in anything he made. He made the whole universe, after all. His glory is his willingness to give it all up. And so the reason John can say we have seen his glory is that John was actually standing at the foot of the cross when Jesus did his, the ultimate act of glory when he died for you. The day he died for you, John was standing there. The day he died for you and your neighbor and your kids. John has given this incredibly high view of who Jesus is. He was the word. Jesus was the word spoken to create the universe. Jesus was the logic, the reason, why, the way it all works. But Jesus is also the word become flesh. In Jesus Christ, the infinite became finite. The all-powerful became powerless. The immortal became mortal, vulnerable, killable. You could touch him. You could smell him. You could feel him. John not only has a high view of Christ, he insists that God has a high view of you. We were so valuable to him that he traded his blood for ours. And when we see Jesus Christ giving up his glory, when we make Jesus Christ our logic, our meaning, our reason for living, our glory, that's when we will truly be one. Earlier, I talked about the experience of the POWs during the Vietnam War. They lived for years in solitary confinement with everything they ever counted on for meaning being taken away. They were forced to live according to the logic of their captors. And yet they discovered they were capable of so much more than they imagined. So former POW Ed Hubbard told another story. He said that during one period, the guards let up. They stopped the torture for a while and so the POWs were then faced with incredible boredom. So one POW had an idea. His mother had made him memorize poetry when he was a kid, and if he could remember the poems, he said, he would teach them to the other inmates, to the other POWs, by tapping out a verse a day on the wall of the cell. The first poem he tried was The Ballad of East and West by Rudyard Kipling. For 44 days, the man tapped out a new verse every day. Ed Hubbard said, they're all doing a pretty good job of memorizing it. Remember, they had no paper. They had nothing to write it down, on, down with. They were doing a pretty good job learning it. And then one day, after 45 days, they heard nothing. Then day 46, they heard nothing. So Ed Hubbard tapped back, Norm, 
How about telling us how the poem ends? Well, it turned out that Norm could not remember two verses. Ed Hubbard said, have you ever read a book to the very end and come to the last page and find that it's been torn out? Then you have an idea how frustrating this was. Aside, he said, from being in prison for six and a half years, this was the most frustrating thing to learn 44 verses of a 46-verse poem and not know how it all came together. But a day later, Norm tapped in again. He said, you guys aren't going to believe this, but I remembered the missing verses, and they are not the last two. They're verses 12 and 26. I'll tap them to you, and all you have to do is insert them into the right place. Imagine, no paper. They're doing it all in their heads. Ed said, you would not believe how hard that was to add in two missing verses, but we did it. Ed said that when he was released from prison three and a half years later, he went to the library and looked up that poem, and he said he had learned it almost perfectly, even though the guy who taught it to them had not even thought about it for 25 years. Friends, if you get your reason for living from politics or your looks or your job or whatever you construct, your life is going to be like a long poem with a couple of verses missing. There is so much more to life than the things we construct on our own. Friends, there is a logic, there is a reason, there is a love, there is a glory that is available to you when everything else in your life is taking away and it has all come to you in the flesh in the person of Jesus Christ. Amen. Friends, would you pray with me? Almighty God, who spoke the universe into being through your only Son, Jesus Christ, we praise you. Lord, we are in awe of you. We bow before you and we worship you. And who are we that you're mindful of us? Who are we that you would send your Son to live and die for us? And not just for us, but for our children and for our neighbors and even for those we choose to hate. Lord, forgive us. Melt our hearts by the beauty of your sacrifice and your glory on the cross. Lord, we come to you in prayer this morning for our world, and we imagine a world free of war and hunger and disease. We pray for Christians everywhere suffering under persecution. We pray for our nation, for our new president, for our leaders, new leaders taking office all over the country. Inspire them all to seek you and your better way. We pray for the men and women of our armed forces and their families and our wounded warriors. We lift up the members of the National Guard, those who leave home and who left home on short notice to protect our capital. We pray for police and firefighters and all of our first responders. We ask your blessing upon our health care workers. Lord, strengthen them and keep them safe. We pray for those suffering from COVID-19. We pray for healing. We thank you for vaccines and we pray for their swift distribution. Lord, if there's bureaucracy in the way, knock it down. We ask you to comfort those who mourn. And Lord, we pray for our city. We pray for business owners and workers, especially our neighbors downtown. We pray for parents and teachers and students. We lift up those experiencing homelessness for all the victims everywhere of injustice. We pray for the downtown churches, both old and new. And we lift up our friends at the Bethesda Community Church and Pastor McKinley, and for the Christian Fellowship Church and Pastor Tillman. And we pray for First Presbyterian Church of Pittsburgh. Help us to care for those you have entrusted to us. 
And we lift up those in our church family who are hurting today and those who are mourning. Lord, hear us now as we pray the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. On earth as it is in heaven, give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Join me in the affirmation of our faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We have walk-in uh, week coming up here soon, uh, and walk-in week is, is that we usually give food to those who are in need, anybody, 
come knocking on our door, we would be willing to give you a basket or a bag of food to go. But something happened this week that is a small little detail uh, that makes walk-in week possible. That is that we uh, get a pallet of food, a shipment of food from the food bank delivered to us. And there was a army of people there to help pick up that pallet, take all that food and put it in our basement and put it in its proper place. I can't stress enough how important this small little thing is to our walk-in week, to make sure that we feed hungry people in our city is, uh, is accomplished by this small army of people. I want to say that uh, when you support First Presbyterian Church, you support small armies of people feeding hungry people. It's important to understand that uh, uh, there's a lot of work that, it's take, that it takes to get the walk-in week going, and this is one of those things. So when you support, know that you support this church and uh, you support its efforts in feeding hunger, or feeding hungry people. Uh, I invite you to uh, please, if you're interested in supporting the church, you can do the QR code in the bulletin. Just take a picture of that with your cell phone, or there's a uh, code giving generously on, there's a tab on our church website and uh, called Giving Generously. And there's also uh, links to our, uh, to our giving of Give Plus app on our Facebook page. Uh, I hope that when you give, that you give with a joyous heart. If your logic, if your reason for being, if your source of meaning in life is something you construct, your life will end up being like a long poem with a couple of verses missing. But if your source of meaning, if your logic, if your reason for life is the ultimate source, Jesus Christ himself, you will live in joy and happiness beyond your imagination, and you will be able to live in peace with everyone. And now, may the Christ who walks on wounded feet walk with you on the road. May the Christ who serves with wounded hands stretch out your hands to serve. May the Christ who loves with a wounded heart open your heart to love. And may you see the face of Christ in everyone you meet. And may everyone you meet see the face of Christ in you. Alleluia. Amen.